Welcome back, Confirmands, as we continue to take a look at the second petition of the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come. And so last time, if you remember, we talked about God as our King. We talked a little bit about earthly kings in general, but we also focused on that question, what does it mean that Jesus is our King? So as always, as we continue to think about these kind of questions, uh, make sure you have with you your catechism. Uh, make sure you have with you a Bible and your workbook, and you can go ahead and turn in your workbook uh, to page 138 as well. That's what where we're going to start for today. And then also make sure you have a pen or pencil uh, so that you can take notes and you can work on your workbook as you go through. Now, uh, we're going to take a look at God's kingdom a little bit today. And what we, you'll need to do is take a look at question 259 in your catechism, because it tells us, uh, about the three ways that God's kingdom is made known to us, how we experience God's kingdom. And the three ways are this, through God's kingdom of power, God's kingdom of grace, and God's kingdom of glory. And so we're going to talk about those three parts of God's kingdom, kingdom of power, kingdom of glory, and kingdom of grace. All right. And we're going to first start with God's kingdom in his power, this kingdom of power. Now, often when we think of the word power, we think of the ways that power is misused or abused by people, maybe just to benefit themselves and not other people. But take a look at question 260 and, and take a look at how God uses his power in his kingdom. All right. It says, how does God rule as king over his creation? It says, God rules over his creation by his goodness in providing life and well-being for all creatures. And also, his power as he restrains evil from overwhelming his creation and holds everyone accountable to him as creator. So, do you hear those two ways? God exercises his power in his, in his goodness, first by providing life. Uh, not just for you, but for all creation. And then he uses his power also to restrain evil. I mean, just think about how awesome those two things are. And some of those things occur just kind of miraculous. We call those miracles, right? Miraculously. But also God exercises this, this kingdom of power just in through everyday things, right? He provides life for us every day in so many ordinary ways. He even restrains evil, sometimes in miraculous ways, but again, sometimes in just ordinary ways, like he gives us government, he gives us police, he gives the military to all kind of restrain evil, and we want to make sure to, to use those things properly. Now, the next way we experience uh, God's kingdom is also through this kingdom of grace. It's God saving us poor, miserable sinners through his son, Jesus Christ. Take a look at question 255 in your catechism as well. And, and it kind of gives you, again, how this kingdom of grace comes about. And also, take a look at page, at page 138 of your workbook, and you'll see a little chart there, a little table. And you can chart out the four ways that we experience this kingdom of grace. First, we experience this kingdom of grace through the entire story of the Old Testament, right? That Christ was promised in the Old Testament. And when the time was just right, the next part of it is, this kingdom was ushered in by Jesus and his, his birth and his ministry, his life and his death and his resurrection. And then we get to experience this kingdom in a third way, this kingdom of grace, when we get a chance to, to hear God speak to us through his word and and. When he comes to us through his Holy Spirit, through through word and sacrament, through the Lord's Supper and baptism. And then there's going to be even more grace upon grace when on that last day Christ will come again to raise the living and the dead. And he'll be fully with us and everything will be made new. Right? Those are some awesome ways that we get to experience this kingdom of grace. And lastly, then, there's this kingdom of of glory. And this is the last way that we're going to experience God's kingdom. And take a look at uh, page 139 of your workbook. And, and you can write down or draw a description of what living under God's kingdom of glory will be like, especially as, as I read these words from Revelation chapter 22. These are, this is a description of that kingdom. Then the angel showed me the river of life, uh, bright as crystal, flowing from the Lamb of God and of the Lamb. 
through the middle of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will the, there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. Now, a lot of this language of Revelation is, is kind of strange. It's a certain type of literature in the Bible called apocalyptic, but we still get some great truths from it. There'll be no more sin, no more death, no more decay. Nature and creation will always be fruitful, and most importantly, we will be with our Lord God forever and ever, and nothing will be able to separate us from our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our brother, Jesus Christ. That's a pretty awesome kingdom of glory, and that's what we strive for, and that's what we await. Now, as always, as you go through your lesson, your workbook on pages 138 and 139, as you read the questions in the catechism, always remember to write down questions or comments that you might have that maybe something's puzzling or, or, or you think is strange and you want to talk about it in class. And then we'll, we'll do that on Sunday. So we'll talk to you soon.